tell you is uh, we won't be here uh, next week so uh, you probably all heard Christine's dad passed yeah. Yeah. Um, so the a funeral is this whole weekend so I, I won't be here next week so um, we'll we convene in two you get a week off or you all can hang out and talk or do whatever it is you want you want to do but we'll we'll come back and get into like things like the four trumpets in two weeks Right, right. That's what <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's pray. Uh, there's a, a prayer on your handout. Um, well, Michelle Olson, who I think you all know, who, who is a member of our church, she introduced me uh, a few weeks ago to the a new a Zealand Book of Common Prayer. So it's the Book of Common Prayer from the Church of New Zealand, which of course is an Anglican church. Um, and it, I was kind of amazed by some of the prayers in it. So here's one of them. It's kind of a re-wording of the Lord's Prayer. So please pray with me. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, a source of all that is and shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, may the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, may the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, may your heavenly will be done by all created beings, may your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. I did too. I was just like, this is a nice, that's, that's, that's really, right. Okay, so, um, we're getting chapter... A six, where we get the things are really getting heavy now, right in the book of Revelation, right? We're we're into the action. So I told you the last week, chapters four and five, where we're in the heavenly throne room. That's what this book is really all about. It's about well, worship, about how we're supposed to be de 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 devoted to God and to well, Jesus, right? But now we're getting all of the things that people are really interested in, right? The end, the end of the world type of stuff, right? And of course, we're going to take up today the four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? Um, before we do that, though, I want to draw us our attention to some st structural things with the book of Revelation as a, as a whole, right? Um, so, one of the first things I'll point out, if you look at my handout as a whole, I'm kind of done chapters 6, 7, and the very beginning of chapter 8, which is the uh, seven uh, seals, right? The first uh, six come, then we get a whole a chapter that interrupts, I call it an interlude, and then we get the, uh, the final one, right? This is a pattern John is going to use at least three more times. So we're going to get three sets of a seven. Here we get a seven a seals. There's this interlude. The a seventh a seal then introduces us to a seven trumpets. Same pattern is going to follow. Then we get um, seven bowls, and then they're, they're all the same events taken from a different per perspective, right? So one of the big things we need to correct is the idea that. John is sort of predicting future events and that these all come in a sequence as if he's telling a story in order the way that we would as good Western people. He isn't doing that, right? He's rather talking about things as they, from different per perspectives. The book does not operate in a linear order. Right. We can tell this because, we'll, we'll get into this a bit more, um, we'll see here the earth is de destroyed. Like all these kind of terrible things happen, like right, the grass is all burned away. Then it comes back again, and it gets burned up again. Like all of these things could repeat. So if the, well, the moon has turned to blood and the, the sun has darkened, but then all of a sudden they're there again for bad things to happen to them again. So it can't be told in sort of this linear order because the earth gets darkened again and then it happens again and then it happens again, right? No, the grass, that happens to 
<laughs> right. <laughs> but it's, this is the point of this isn't how, quite how this is working. The other big, big thing is he's a good storyteller and he's putting questions into the text that then get answered. So if you look at chapter 6, we get all this description of horror, right? All these bad things are going to happen. And it ends with everybody's hiding. And they say, who can stand, right? And we're probably supposed to, to, to answer that question, no one can. Who can stand before God's a wrath and all this horror, right? But then people are depicted as standing. If you look at chapter 7, turn the handout over, the angels first are standing there. I've highlighted the words standing. But then there's this great crowd that's standing. Right, so it's chapter 7, I think starting around verse 9 or 10, we get, it's verse 9, we get all this great crowd, right, from every tribe and tongue and nation, and they're standing before the throne. So there are people who can stand, the faithful, the church, the believers, whatever we want to call them, right? So um, yep. Yep. We're going to talk about that today. Yep. Is, is something that's in other religions, correct? Well, so like the Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups like that, like they make a big deal of this and take it as a very literal number. Um, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but that's, it's too, again, he describes the same thing from different per perspectives. So if you recall back in chapter 5, we talked about this last week, he hears um, the chorus of, of angels and everybody talking about the Lion of Judah, which of course is Jesus. He's going to come conquering his Lion. And then he turns, so he hears that, he turns around and what does he see? He sees a lamb that looks like it's been slain. So he hears about a lion, but what does he see? He sees a lamb. Same thing here. So if you actually look, where is it in there? Um, chapter 7, verse 4. Uh, then I heard the number of the Kassil, 12,000 from every tribe, right? And then after these things, I looked, and behold, what does he see? A great crowd. So it's the same thing. Right, of he hears about 144,000. It's 12,000 from every tribe. We'll get back to what all that means, but it's a Jews, right? Yeah. Then he turns around, what does he see? He sees this innumerable multitude from every tribe, tr tongue, nation. Right, and so it's actually it's ex exploding all kinds of categories. That this isn't just for the a Jews, that Abraham's deep. Descendants are everyone everywhere who has a faith, right? So it's a, it's this. He's going to use these kinds of deep, deep devices often, right? But to take that 144,000 as literal is just a, a mistake. These people probably had a hard time counting Well, I mean it's. There's a couple things going on here, and we're, and we're getting ahead. I mean, I was going to introduce that later. Um, I mean, one way to think about it, I mean, if you read your Old Testament, when we get a list of numbers, like they go through and talk about there were this many from this tribe, this many from this tribe, what are they doing? Telling you it's a lot of people. Well, telling you it's a lot of people, but why do you count real people? Census. Census. Okay, so that's, this is what this is. It's a census. But why do you take... A census in the ancient world. Taxes. It's not taxes, though it's kind of related to that. A military. You're assessing your military a might. So what do we have here? We have the perfect army. 12,000 people from all 12 tribes. So 12,000 times 12 is 144,000, right? We've got, it's all this number perfectionism. It's not actually literal numbers, it's 12,000 from the 12 tribes, which is perfect. But then what do they do? They don't conquer by force. We're actually told how they conquer, right? Because he turns and sees not 12,000 from each tribe, he sees this great number. The angel asks him a question, one of the, one of the 24 four, four, four elders says, well, who are these people? And, and it's, it's 
this kind of fun thing in the text of uh, John goes, um, you're the angel, you tell me, basically. <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. Like, yes, he says that. He says, go, my Lord, who you know. <laughs> right? Um, and then the angel answers him and says, these are the ones who have come from the great tri tribulation. They have washed their groves and whitened them in the blood of the lamb. So, Again, our temptation with this kind of thing is to say, well, yes, these are people who have been for forgiven by what Jesus did, which is true, but that's not what this phrase here means. They're well, martyrs. So they're people who have been oppressed and have suffered and been purified in that, in that way. So we have this great number. They're an army. They're going to conquer the world, but how do they do it? Now, through violence, they do it the same way Jesus did by suffering to the point of death. This is how God operates. He doesn't use violence. He doesn't use coercion. There are people who... The, the, the term here that's all in this text over and over and over again is patient endurance. Right? This is how they, they conquer. Right? Which is... There's, this, there's contrast here, John. They're really intentional. Like There's all this sort of threat of violence but yet God is constantly promising grace and mercy and for, for, forgiveness. That sh contrast should strike us constantly. Right. So let's, let's go through a couple things. So I want to make, a, again, a couple observations. The big one here is we get this question, who can stand? The answer is God's faithful can stand, right? But they're, they're de described in a way in terms of right, how can they stand because God helps them. So this is where reformed here to a de degree as pres Presbyterians. Our language for this is the elect. Yeah. So this is who this is, right? This 144,000, which is also this great crowd, these are God's elect. So God's empowered them to endure. Tim? So are they elected to the discrimination of the unelected? No. <laughs> They're elect to bear well, witness to the whole world of what God's kingdom is like, right? And to, like Jesus, persevere to move to the point of death, right? I mean, there is, there's a contrast in here, again, of we, we're going to see them here in chapter 7, right? They're, they're basically asking, actually, it's at the, end of, at the end of chapter 6. I mean, yeah, so it's in chapter 6, the, the martyrs Ask, how long, O oh, Master, holy and true, will you not pass good judgment and do good justice for our blood? Right. So there is an element here of, we should ask, well, aren't we supposed to turn the other cheek? This is this revenge. I think there's an element here, though, of these aren't people who need to be forgiven for their sins. They're people who have been persecuted because they're faithful. And God is going to, so God is going to pass a judgment, but He's going to vindicate them. And there's nothing in here that says He's going to sort of punish the evil ones. He says He's going to vindicate them. There is a, a degree of those who continue to per assist in destroying the world will, will face a judgment. Um, so, again, there's all this. A judgment in here and punishment, but the people who are going to be punished and judged, even I don't even want to use the word people, the forces that will be punished and judged are those who are trying to destroy God's good creation. So God is going to dis destroy, but it's the things that He's destroying are any forces that attack what's good, right? And it doesn't have to be sort of eradication. It's they will be moved to repent. But the door is left open for people who continue to could refuse. So, right. <laughs> I know it's, it's sorry. Go ahead. So this some of this to me seems like um, it's uh, Greek and Roman type gods. Yep. You know, where they're viewing I'm gonna, I don't yep. know my mythology great, but this guy is the God is going to take revenge and lead you towards the destruction of my enemies. And, 
So I, I, I'm not quite sure. I actually just told your wife I'm sure we could take this book out right. of the Bible. But for me, I'm not convinced that it is either. Right. But um, I don't view God as a wrathful God. I don't think God has an inherent ability to have wrath. And so I'm really troubled, and I think these passages have been taken over 2,000 years yeah. to justify, especially when you're reading this, wait till you put the seal on my head, and then I'm going to come down and destroy everybody else at the end of the first. Yeah, don't damage the earth till you put the seal on my head. So I get sealed, I'm saved, and then yeah. you can come down and destroy everybody who is contrary to my belief. But it's, it's even worth pointing out, those who are sealed, who are they protected from. They are to a degree protected from, from the a judgment that God allows to happen, but they're not protected from the violence of other evil forces. So they're still, like, they're still a suspect to the violence of other human, human beings. John definitely thinks there are, for lack of a better term, deep demonic forces in the world that they're not immune to, to, to those t t t t attacks either, right? But I think there's an element here in which we have to continually come back to this case of is any of this depicting things that will really happen in terms of these are concrete future e e e e events or is the world just bad because of Hassan? And all these things are, are, are happening. And there is an element in which God is going to protect the elect, right? Um, but again, part of the goal is to bring everybody into that group, right? And the fact that they're constantly depicted as being huge and innumerable, it's this hope of everyone should come be part of, of us, but it's also balanced with this idea of we are being actively persecuted for our faith. And we have hope that God will put an end to this. Right? So it's. Let's. I want to actually get into some of the textual things to, to see what's happening. Uh, Jeff. You just said something. Yeah. It's like John sees demonic forces at work. Yeah. Now, you probably could. Mary Magdalene was possessed by seven demons, and then there was the guy where Jesus said, "Get out!" and the demons went into the into the pigs yep. and we don't know what happened to the demons that possessed Mary but I think we can make the assumption that Jesus cast those demons out so it's that would have been like the learning point then for John that there are evil forces demonic forces at work because he saw Jesus Repel them. So right. Am I making a well, I mean, but he's, yeah, it's, it is that, but I mean, this is on a bigger uh, scale. So we're going to get introduced in later chapters to things like the a beast and the Antichrist. I mean, these are their powers in the world that are trying to destroy God's good creation. And God's going to put an end to, to those. So you can think of what happens in the very end, right? Everything is anew. There's no longer any a death and all these kinds of things. It's because those powers have been dis destroyed. So there are these forces in the world. People can align with them. You'll put an end to them. It's kind but of it's where Christine's main point was. Of all that stuff she was reading in that chapter, yep. which I know is ahead of it, yep. um, that God could take a third of this, a third of that, and so forth and so forth. But right, and, well, and I think this is the right way to, to read what's happening yeah. here. Is part of this is being put forward to us of this is what God could do. Right. He could really like dis, dis, destroy the earth, yeah. right? But yeah. part of the element is God doesn't operate that way. Right. I don't think. Sorry, well, yeah. I don't think God can do that. I don't think. Well, it's it's the idea is it's with his it's within his power. I guess I don't yeah. know. I, I think that's not even within God's sight. Well, but, but no, but that's actually of John's argument. This isn't God's character. It is within his power. Yeah, but not within his character. Not within his character. So he isn't going to dis dis destroy the world. And actually, the picture John is painting is, what if God did? And it says, it's, what it's actually doing is actually saying, what if God was like Rome or like the Roman gods? This is what he would do. And it would be terrible. But that isn't how God operates. That's not his character. How does God conquer? Because God does conquer. He conquers through patient endurance 
plus suffering with death. Good, we We're supposed to do that too. <laughs> right. Right. But it's so but 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 there is the idea here God is key I mean again it's capable, I want to be really clear what I mean by capable, right? Of I mean this is gonna sound terrible and I'm trying to I'm trying to make an analogy. I could go home today and kill my kids. That's within my capacity. I have the power to do that. It's not my character. There's no way I would do that. I love them. But do you understand that I have the power to do it? So that the idea is God has the power to do this, but he, he won't. It's not how God operates. Because he won't. Because he's right, exactly, right? Because um, it's character. I mean, it's not the way he operates. He isn't like this. And that's a contrast in, intentionally there of what does Jerome do and the forces of the, of the world when they conquer? They de destroy and coerce and co force. God does not operate that way. But we are given a picture of what if God did? Nobody's got a chance. But it then. makes even more sense than if, he, if he's comparing the Roman gods to God. Yeah. Okay, and the Roman gods are full of vengeance and destruction. And it isn't even the Roman gods, it's so much more the, the, the Roman attitude. I mean, that's the, I mean, for John's first readers, the enemy he's holding out is Rome. What are they doing to us? Well, in some, okay, we need to go all the way back to chapters 2 and two and 3 where we get the uh, seven uh, churches. Some Christians are being killed for their uh, faith. Others aren't. Others are doing very well, but it's in part because they're colluding. And what John is doing here is saying, whose team are you on? I mean, all this sort of contrast here of the, the people on the earth and the people up in, in heaven where everything's perfect, John is basically saying, are you going to identify with those who have been martyred? Or are you going to ident identify with the, the Romans? Yep. Sorry. Don't go, you're fine. Oh, I just was wondering, is this a way that <laughs> um, I mean, there's, I don't, wouldn't quite want to put it that way, but there is an element of, so again, if you go to that, that's why the, the, the chapters 2 and 3 are key with the, the letters to the seven churches. It's quite clear that a few of them are willing to compromise in order to stay in Rome's good graces. Right? So they, they're doing well. The church in Laodicea is doing very well financially. It's probably because some of their members are, have joined a guild and they're willing to offer sacrifices to the emperor in order to sort of say, well, yeah, we'll just do this. We don't really mean it. It's just a social thing. And John's saying, you can't. Right? Because then you're actually buying into the, to the people who are killing our brethren elsewhere. Right. Whose team are you on? Yeah. So, yep. so I, I still want to go back to this character. Yep. So I'm probably going to say very blasphemous. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so I do not think that God did the plagues. I think it's political revisionist history to justify a freeing of a nation who was enslaved. That's me. I don't also think that God created the flood because it you take right. those things and then you say it's not within God's character, the argument would be made that God wiped out all these people with the flood, killed them all, and then killed the firstborn of the Egyptians because they were acting in a manner contrary to his chosen people. And so I get real troubled when I read this and people go back and say, well, then God used his wrath to do those things. So, and so yeah. that would be, you would say that if God did that then, was that within God's character to kill the firstborn, innocent kids of all these people, or to destroy the flood? Or we could say, well, God woke up after that and said, you know what, I made a mistake. The flood didn't cure anything. People still sinned after the flood. I. So there, though, the, but I, there's an element here. Of, so John is clearly, I mean, the, the, the Exodus is very much in the background. And the plays things that happen here all throughout the book should be tied back to the Exodus. That's what's in, what's in her mind. So there is an idea here of this is a second Exodus on an even bigger scale. God's going to save his people. But the hint is that that's potentially everybody. Potentially everybody's 
part of God's people now. This is great a multitude. What do we do with the people who continue to refuse to get on board? There's an element here in which God says, you made your own bed, lay in it. I'm not going to force you out of it. Because I don't operate that way. I don't coerce. I don't make you come, come join come my side. But there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a picture being painted here of, here are the consequences for you if you don't. And it isn't that God is actively making it happen, it's He's allowing it to happen. He's allowing the sin and evil to run its course. But it's ultimately going to de de destroy. I think this will highlight, if we get into the four horsemen, we'll begin to see how some of this works. I did question yep. Christine about yep. her sermon. <coughs> it felt to me like there was a threat. I was saying, okay, look, I can do this. But it's not so much a threat as saying, if, if you want me to operate this way, here's what's going to happen. And you don't want, you don't, you don't want this. Right? Because I'm so powerful, I'll overwhelm everything. Nobody's got a chance. If I tap into that aspect. Right? So let's look at the four, four horsemen. So right, the background of this is the Glam has been judged worthy to open the seals. He does so... We get the four horsemen, right? This is the pattern, by the way, that's gonna, gonna follow with the other ones too, of the first four come really quick, they're a unit. Boom, 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 boom. And then the, the next two are ex expanded, they take more space. We get an interlude, and then we get the final one. Same thing's gonna happen with the trumpets. Same thing will happen with the, with the bulls. There's a, there's a pattern, right? He, he likes this, these kinds of patterns. Okay, so the four horsemen. What's the uh, first one? First one is the white horse. The guy on it's got a bow. He's got a crown, or well, technically it's a g g laurel wreath, which is a g Roman c crown. He goes like a conqueror bent on con c quest. We're going to see this with all four of these. These are perpetual problems human beings face. They're not sort of pointing to one thing that's going to happen in the c c future. This is constant. What is this? This is the threat of a war, the threat of being conquered by an external force. So if John was an American in the 21st century, he'd describe this first horse in terms that would make us think of, I don't know, China or Russia, because that's the threat that we per per perceive. The idea here with a bow, any person who's in Rome at this time is going to think Parthians. So the Parthians are the empire that's basically um, the western Turkey that goes all the way to Pakistan. So it's this big other empire. Rome could, could never defeat them. And they were very famous for being mounted archers. So that's the imagery. This is the, the Parthians, P-A-R-T-H-I-A-N-S, right? Parthians don't get de destroyed until the... Um, Iranians will be the Persians rise up in the third century, and then they all become a Muslim in the eighth century. But it's this, it's this empire, and it's the, it's the external threat if you're a Roman. That's the people who we can't beat. They've actually beaten us a couple of couple of times, and we the, we're just kind of holding them at bay. Where does their empire be begin? Hold on. It begins in Western Turkey. Where are we? John is writing to Asia. Kaminer, which is, well, not, that is Western Turkey. This is from Eastern Turkey, right? So they're really close. The border of this area is the border with the Parthian, Parthian Empire. So if you're worried about being attacked by an outside force, even if you're a Christian here, you're really happy to be part of the... Roman Empire because they're protecting you from the Parthians. And John's argument here is don't count on it. Anything can happen. Right? The real p p protection that you need is the one offered by God. The Romans aren't going to keep you safe. They could lose. So this was written 20 to 30 years after the siege? Uh, so yeah, I mean this is probably yeah, somewhere, it's, it's 90 AD, right? Um, so I mean, it's, but that I mean, that's you're talking about those the siege in 
to Jerusalem. That's yeah. her Romans attacking the Jews. Right. But this is more, I mean, this is now a mixed a Gentile Jewish the churches in Asia, Comina, so Western Turkey, they are thinking the real external threat is the Parthians. This is a perfect de 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 description of them. It's also a good description of the Babylonians, who are Israel's sort of perpetual enemy. So it's saying these are the stereotypical external forces that could attack us. War is always a threat, right? I mean, there's a reason why our polit politicians could drum up fear. They want to protect us, right, from the enemy. Well, John's doing a bit of that, right? He's saying, Garom is telling you, we'll keep you safe. John's saying, P.S. <laughs> <laughs> we can't help you. They can, I mean, they can, only God can really help you. Right, that's the image here. Right, we go to the next one. Right, it's a fiery horse. It's red. Was getting given the power to take peace from the earth. This represents in internal conflict. So this is people who say, "I don't want to be part of Rome," or "We're going to protest for you know certain rights." And John is saying, "This is a perpetual threat. There's always the threat of internal conflict. Any community faces this." Right? And Garone comes and says, we will offer you peace. We've conquered you, but yes, now you get to be part of our empire. We're going to give you roads and a good sewage system and just stay in line. Do things our way. And John's saying that isn't ever going to last. They could turn on you at any a moment. You think you're safe, but you aren't. Right? Stand up for those who are oppressed because you could become like them really quickly. It's interesting what you said about the white horse. In my footnote in my Bible, it says it's a reference to Christ. Yeah, it's, it, it's not. It's not. It, the <laughs> footnote's wrong. Right. I mean, it's, that's my, my interpretation of this. It's well, not what a... What you're saying makes more sense yep. to me. Um, and I, again, these aren't sort of, it isn't a, John's saying this is a particular threat. I mean, he is kind of tapping into very con con contemporary things for his time, but it's also our time. It's human beings everywhere at, at all times. This is our, our threat. So external conflict, war with an enemy. That's the first horse. Horse two is internal conflict with our selves. The third conflict is, the third horse is economic yep problems, right? So we actually get here a very concrete thing. He says, a quart of wheat for a D, an areas, which is a, a day's pay, and three, I, I spelled that wrong, it says there, should say three, three quarts of barley for a D, an areas, but do not damage the oil or the wine. So a quart, what's the commensurate here being used for quart, is what an average adult needs in a day. And a D, an heir is a day's wage for a common laborer. So what it's saying here is inflation's gotten so bad that the average worker can buy enough wheat for them themselves for a day with their daily wage. That's all they can afford. You can't afford it. You may take all your money just to buy food. Or you can buy barley, which is less nutritious, and feed a family. It's because you can get three quarts of that. So you're just above starvation. That's how bad things have, have, have gotten. But the wine and the oil haven't gotten expensive. Because those are luxury goods. So the picture being painted here is the poor, in, the economies are so terrible the poor are really the suffering. The rich can get through it. They're going to have a huge hit to their portfolios, but they're not going to starve. Right? But right, again, this is a perpetual problem. There's always economic problems. And inflation is always a, a threat. Right? Again, if, if John was writing this to today, he'd be talking about the price of eggs here. <laughs> right? I mean, this is the kind of thing. I, I see parallels. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Right. I mean, but, 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 but this is the problem. This is this is this is constant. This isn't sort of a thing just for John's context. This is always the problems humans have. Right. This is. I mean, what he's well, all he's painting here is this is what it's like to live in a world that's plagued by sin. This is what a fallen world is like. These are perpetual problems, right? Um, and so, I mean, what here is setting up this is this this k- 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 threat, right? So, I mean, this is the, I mean, so this is problems created by scarcity, by inflation. The Romans really engaged in p- p- price con- con- controls for the poor. They actually said you can't charge c- c- more than so come much for a wheat. Um, if things were really scarce, you could double the price, but you couldn't go beyond it. And the average price was 16 quarts of wheat for a denarius. So you could buy, right, if you had a family of four with a day's wage, you could buy four days worth of food. Of good food. Wheat. But things have gotten so terrible that you can't. I mean, this is even beyond the, the Romans' price con- control. But he's kind of depicting this is what could happen. Things can get this bad, right? And if we, I mean, if we go down a bit, right? The but, but even to the extreme, they, yeah. they are, you know, embellishing it. Yeah, yeah. He's but but but, but and, and even then, if we go down to the the sixth seal, right? Everybody's on the hook here, right? I mean, so he, he, he goes on and says, the kings of the earth, um, I translate this term entrepreneurs, it's, it actually means important economic people. That's what the term means, so I use it, we could say, I guess, tycoons, right? Military commanders, the rich and the powerful, and everyone else, because slave and free. I mean, here he's saying, even the powerful and the wealthy won't be exempt from this. Everybody's going to be equal in terms of a suffering. Right? Th- things are going to get uh, so terrible that, or potentially could get uh, so terrible that, everybody's going to hide. Right? Everybody's going to want to say, keep us <coughs> from this. So he is painting a picture of how bad things are going to, to get. Right? Of course, the fourth, if we go to the fourth horseman, the pale horse, right? That's death. Well, death gets everybody in the end. If you somehow manage to avoid the first three, you're still going to die, <laughs> right? That's I mean that's that's the, the picture he's painting, right? These are the again all of this is a description of here's the world that we're actually in. Are you going to put your hope in this world, or are you going to put it in God? That's the argument, right? Because this world actually can't help you. You can if you Ally with the rich and powerful, with the Romans, there's no guarantee all these things don't still happen. That's the picture being painted here, right? Um, so I mean, we get these four. I mean, so they are, the, he's doing it in a way that speaks to people of this time, but if we understand it, we can say this applies to us too. It applies to everybody, everywhere, always. These are the problems that potentially face us. I mean, think about the last couple of years here. Horsemen's two and three are pretty relevant, right? We've experienced internal conflict, protest, in sur- sur- corrections, all these kinds of things. We've experienced plagues, <laughs> right? I mean, and we've seen all the, all these kinds of things, right? I mean, so these are the p- potential problems. And he's saying, like, this is the world that we're in. Don't think you're going to escape this. It's going to get you a somehow, right? This is the fallen world. It isn't God actively doing that. That's the important thing. If God is allowing it to happen. He isn't causing it. He isn't saying this is what I'm going to, to, to do. Right? He actually needs to save us from these things. But that's part of what's being what we're being told here is whose side do you want? So if you even look at seal five and six, it's a contrast. Seal five is the people up in heaven who have died for the faith, right? They're asking for justice. They're told to arrest, right? So things are good for them. They're able to 
Baruch rest, they're at peace. This is contrasted with seal 6, which is everything's terrible, right? There's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. The entire moon becomes like blood. The stars fall from the sky, right? The sky disappears. I mean, this is so... I mean, these things can actually happen, right? The physical world doesn't operate this way. He's painting a picture to say this is how bad things are, right? Who are you with? Are you with the martyrs or are you with the people here who are the ones actually killing your co religionists right? Can we go back to the yep. section where when they cried out how long was saying how long yep. the master holy and true without not passing judgment and justice for our blood, which was shed by those who so who's asking for that? What's that? Who's uh, the Verse, Verse 9. Um, How long, O Master, holy and true? Yep. Yeah. Well, do not pass judgment and justice for our blood, which was shed by those who Yeah, because right before that says, then they cried out. Who's so these are they? the martyrs. And these are the martyrs, right. So is this... What is well, so, but we need to ask, what are they asking? Are they asking for asking. Her revenge? I don't see... It. No, it doesn't necessarily have to be her revenge. They're rather asking to be vindicated. So, I mean... They've died humiliating, unjust deaths. In some ways, just like what Jesus has. So, right? what is the justice that the, the justice is that they are restored and vindicated, and that these kinds of things don't continue to happen. I mean, we can ask in terms of um, does God's grace and mercy and love equal? Um, I'm not going to do anything. Or does it mean I'm going to stop my people from being slaughtered? But you can stop violence without having to re resort to violence. Go ahead. I, ha I, I find that a little disturbing because um, if they're martyrs and they were killed, they were killed because of what they were doing for God. Right. I don't believe, I don't believe that they would be wanting vindication. I believe they would want it stopped so that nobody else ends up like that. I mean, so to get that out of the way, so to speak, get it out of the way of your God. Because why, why would they want vindication when they stood up for God? I, I'm, I'm not... Because it's convinced. still the case that this ought would not have, have happened, right? So, I mean, the picture being painted here of God's redemption isn't only that, well, bad things have, have, have happened. I'm going to fix it so that they don't happen any more. It's God will repair all the things that have happened in the past, too. There is a vindic vindic vindication. So, what yep. that vindication means, and justice means, is that the love of God is, would not the vindication be through the perpetual love of God and the relationship of people afterwards? Because yeah. wouldn't that be the ultimate response to vindicate what they believed and what they died for? If they died for because of, of their love of neighbor, wouldn't the ultimate vindication be for God to perpetuate love of neighbor? But what do you do when the the neighbors refuse to love back and can, can continue to do I, I violence. Think, I think that's their choice back. Mm -hmm. But to infuse, because I think some of this stuff was taken by the Holy Roman Empire to perpetuate slaughter. Oh, absolutely. So the, the, this is there's there's a deep potential here for this being mis from a so which is what is all, what what is, what does <coughs> ultimately vindicate someone who loves someone? Who dies because they yep. love someone. What is the ultimate vindication? The ultimate vindication is the heaven that's supposed to, when we pray, heaven come down to yep. earth. Is that not the ultimate vindication? Because but that, that, that heaven coming down to earth still means that the, these forces of, I'm just going to call them forces of, of evil, have to be removed. Right. And I think it's even worth pointing out when we get to, to the very the very end. So we've got this, you know, the new heaven comes down to earth. And it's huge. Right? It's, 10, 000, it's a 10,000 by 10,000 by 10,000 yeah. cubic cube. It's pre preposterous, right? Um, 
even there, there are still people out aside. Um, and they're welcome to come in, but they have to get on board. So there's this, there is this issue of God does not co coerce and force, but he is finally going to co arrange things so that evil cannot affect others. So there still has to be this re removal of the evil. And that's the, that's the I mean, we need to figure out how to, so, I mean, again, this is a perpetual problem. I mean, what do you do, I mean, let's just ask ourselves, what do we do if we, let's say we're good people, right? And we are going to stop an opposing force that's trying to, you know, hurt the, hurt the poor and oppressed. And we have the power to do so. We can hold them at bay forever. Is that what we do, or do we finally sort of stop them? And it's this question of, do we use violence or not? And then God is saying, I'm not going to use violence, but I am going to sort of hold this at bay. And they're either going to come, they're going to repent and will join us, or they will just wither away. And it's their own fault. But the consequence of God's actions to a degree is they're going to end unless they repent, right? So there's this, I mean, again, it's, it isn't God actively doing it. That's what the Romans would do. We're going to conquer you and like, force you to do things our way. God isn't going to force anyone. But the consequence of not joining does lead to destruction of a, of a kind. And we need to ask, is there any alternative? I mean, do we want people who are violent and want to oppress others there in heaven? No, they can't be there or heaven is in heaven. But if they don't repent, either God forces them or he keeps them out aside. What happened? I mean, and I think John's trying to say God doesn't force. So what happens to them? Right. It's, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's the way to think of it. It's their choice, but there's still the potential for very bad things to happen to people. Bob, you had your hand up. <coughs> I was just thinking there's, uh, there's a big difference between vindication and retribution. Right. It's not, it's, it's, it's not retribution. Yeah, most of those things of revelation and retribution, God's going to do this, that, and the other thing, to destroy things. Whereas the, the saints want vindication, meaning if the world would accept compassion, yep. mercy, love, grace, and the world became a good place to be, and that would be their vindication. So I, th I think that's the way to think of this is, well, justice isn't getting no revenge. I mean, th th this is, I think this is part of the problem. We are so, we are, our selves are so corrupted by Hassan that we think we hear language of justice and what do we think? We think of, well, this person did something bad, let's send them to prison to punish them. This is how we think of it. We're going to punish these people. And this isn't what God is doing. He's not punishing in terms of retribution. He is um, creating a world that's just in which these things don't happen. But he's also doing it in a way where he isn't forcing the people who are doing the, the violence to stop doing it. He isn't forcing them to, to do things his way. He's just holding them at bay. Which means they're ex excluded. It's repent or be ex 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 excluded, right? So then prisons ideally would be just removing people from society who are going to continue to do bad things from society so but there should also be a, them, yeah yeah we're just setting them aside so they don't continue to hurt people. right but then there should also be an element of trying to rehabilitate them right which is what also is happening here constantly i mean it's this constant call to sort of come re repent Right. I realize we're up for time, so if you're going to the first uh, service, go. Um, the one other thing I want to just highlight quick is what happens in chapter 7. Right? Um, so again, I mean, we're, here we're actually getting a vision that preempts the end, the very, very end of the book. So we get the, the, the angels are there. The angels, what are, they, what are they doing? They're holding back the four winds. I mean, this, by the way, this whole chapter, it's a fire hose of the Old Testament. It's just every word has got the Old Testament behind it. So it's all these Old Test Testament prophets. I put a few things in the footnotes, right? 
So the angels are holding back the winds that won't, so they don't dis destroy the earth. Because right? if the angels stop, the winds are going to come de 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 destroy it, right? They're given the power to damage the earth, right? But then they're told not to do it. We get the consensus of the army, right? Then we turn and it's a great crowd. This crowd, of course, praises God. This is a liturgy again. They're able to, to, to stand. Then the elders ask, who, who, who are these? But then we get this language of, um, for this reason there before the, the throne of God, right? So they're there because like Jesus, they were faithful, right? So that they're being, this are the examples we're supposed to follow, right? And what are we told? God will dwell with them day and night. They'll be, will be with them. They will, they will neither hunger again nor thirst again, neither will the sun or any scorching heat be down on them. For the Lamb in the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear. Revelation chapter 21, let me find my notes here, ends with this. So this is chapter 21, verses 3 and 4. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with human beings. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God will be, God himself will be with them, and will be their God. He will who wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be a no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be a no more. For the first things have passed away. So he's giving us a foretaste of what's coming here. And this is constant, right? So we're getting bombarded with sort of violence and terror. Chapters 6 to chapter 16 are just constant plagues and terror. But it's... <laughs> interrupted over and over again with this idea of God's going to make everything perfect. Everything will be restored. Everything will be made canoe, right? Um, and it's this constant call to repent. Come be with us. Come be here for the kingdom of God rather than the kingdoms of this world. And the, the constant message is you don't ever see God's forces turning to use violence. They always conquer by taking that violence on. Right. So again, it's Jesus, the martyrs here, how do they conquer? They conquer by en enduring oppression. You don't ever turn and respond with violence. Because right? that's how, how God operates. This is hard. Because <laughs> right? our instincts are always to fight back. Right? And there is an element, I mean, and I think this will get to Tim. I mean, Tim, you're, you're rightly upset, but I think this is the, the, um, the hard part of this, is that patient and endurance has to have a limit, or has to have a way of saying this has to be put to an end. I mean, the, the, the place I would put it is, the other way that this could be abused is, what do you tell like African Americans who are you know, perpetually being dis discriminated against. Do you tell them, well, just patiently endure it and it'll get a bit better when Jesus returns? Because that's actually what people, they've often been told. Right? The element here is, no, you do need to stand up to it. You need to c c c resist. You need to speak to what's c c just. But you don't use the tools of violence to do so. You rather engage in a, a non-violent rebel, rebel I mean, actually, the term that I always translate patient endurance, some translators translated canon violent protest. That's the idea, right? Of, you don't, it's not being passive. It's saying we will not use the weapons of the world. But there is a battle here. We have an army. But we don't conquer with arms. We conquer by suffering. Right. And that's, I mean, this is, but again, but again, it's this, the problem that John is really taught, I mean, who's, who's his, his audience? His audience is the church. And the problem is the church has got different people doing different things. Some people are doing it this way. They're being told there's hope. You'll be vindicated. Others are colluding with the Romans. Others are trying to have it both <coughs> ways. 
And John is kind of saying, you can't. You've got to pick one. Pick a side. Are you with the martyrs? Are you going to patiently endure? Or are you going to be part of the empire and tolerate all this, all this evil? Right? I mean, again, these are problems we perpetually face. Right. Yeah, it just rings so true today. I mean, absolutely, it's right? Like, wow. <laughs> so, okay, we're way over time, so yeah, sorry. I think it's time. You, you write this. <laughs> there, I mean, this is, I'm not making this up. I mean, it's... No, 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 no I'm, so we get our footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean,